we are um, on the we're in church, and we are now at the 19th of July. In some months now in the lockdown, but we've got this um, uh, limited ability to gather together, which is a great thing. We're here together. Um, we're going to look at John uh, chapter 21, and uh, can we just pray before we read? Well, we thank you so much that you have given us your word and uh, we know that it is true we know that it comes from God to man and is able to feed our souls you've said man doesn't live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God and we want to hear you this morning we do not want to hear man we want to hear you, you speaking to us today Amen so I'm reading uh, from John 21 verse, 20, verse 15 to 19 so when they dined this is after the resurrection and they meet Jesus on the shore you remember this situation when they dined Jesus said to Simon Peter Simon son of Jonas lovest thou me more than these he saith unto him yea Lord thou knowest that I love thee he saith to him feed my lambs he saith to him again the second time Simon son of Jonas lovest thou me he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved, because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say to you, when you were young, you girded yourself and walked where you would. But when you shall be old, you'll stretch forth your hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, Follow me. I've got a title for the talk, which is Reasons to Love. Reasons to Love. And Peter had tried so hard and we know that he was a man who did love the Lord Jesus and when uh, they are having to face the arrest and then the judgment and then the terrible suffering and execution of Christ Peter's courage fails but it's a, it's a failure of courage not of love and in a way the two things are hand in hand um, in, in our spiritual life that's true but this was a failure of courage not of love but it is the issue of love that has to be re-examined and considered when Peter is being restored and it is the great thing it's, it's the key thing it is so important love it's been on my heart so much recently and um, you know the passages in the scriptures which are so very clear and very profound um, you, one would go straight to 1 Corinthians 13 don't go there but in our thinking and in our recollection of what God's word says on the subject of love and its importance there's no better chapter is there there's these three things faith, hope and love but the greatest of these says the apostle Paul is love and he makes the point at the beginning of that chapter that we can have this curious spiritual gifting where we can speak in tongues like an angel we can move mountains by faith we can understand all mysteries and there's a list of incredible uh, spiritual giftings but if we haven't got love it means nothing and as I was really thinking about this the church at Ephesus came to mind in connection with the um, Admonition which Christ gives to those seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, which we studied not long ago, and I think I hope you remember some of it because it's incredibly important that those churches were addressed by the Son of God and He identified their true condition. And it's it's a shock, isn't it, when that happens to you? I don't know, did you ever ask God to show you where you are spiritually? I do, and it's not always very comfortable but it's best to know isn't it it's best to know and uh, he says to them um, you you work hard you are patient you can't bear those who are frauds those who 
call themselves apostles and come among you with a kind of ministry that seems good, but you seem, you've been able to see right through that. And your works are better than ever, but I've got this against you. You have left your first love. And it's very serious because I will come quickly and remove your candlestick. You won't any longer shine as a church giving light. And every church should shine and give light to the world. That's the, that's the purpose of a church, probably more than anything else. But if you haven't got love, that light goes wrong. And that light becomes wrong. It becomes a darkness, actually. You can, just, you can carry on doing all the things, all the routines of the work of the church, even the outreach, even the praying, the gathering together, even the study of God's word. But without love, that light goes out. And, it, and it's, it's urgent because he says, I'll come to you quickly and remove your candlestick if you don't get back to where you were with your first love. So that's the importance of it. And I think maybe there's many references, but those just to um, mention those two references, 1 Corinthians 13, read the chapter. Uh, it's got more than what I've just said in it. Very, very rich and very important. And then the word to that first, the first of the seven churches, the church at Ephesus. So many good things about them, but this spoils everything. And it, and it, it makes it liable for them to lose uh, their position as a candlestick, shining as a light in the world. And, and I, as I was thinking, you know, Lucifer is a light bearer. Did you, you, you know that, don't you? It's a light bearer. Shining in this world very brightly. It says in Revelation 12, he deceiveth the whole world. And if ever there was a light that is darkness, that is it, isn't it? But it's very effective and very widespread and a million miles away from what God intends men to know and see. And the church has to be, that's why the church has to be so different a blazing light and it's essential that we have love love to Christ, love to one another love to the, the, the souls of men so he puts this question to uh, Peter's being restored but he puts this question to Peter, do you love me? and can I just say this, and I made a note to say this, it's a question that I think we all need to think about in relation to God the God who made us, do I love my maker? Do I love him? Do I actually love him? It, well, it's a commandment from heaven, isn't it? The first of the commandments, the greatest of the commandments, when they ask Christ that question, which is the greatest of the commandments, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind, every fibre of your being, absolutely, passionately loving God, and love your neighbour as yourself, which is like the, the second commandment, which is like the first. And every human being should love God. And if we don't love God, spiritually, and make no mistake about this, we are in a state of death. Is that, is that true? I'd say it's, it's severe, and it's meant to shake us, as well as it shakes me. If I don't really love God, something is desperately wrong with me, spiritually. And we're told, if you love me, keep my commandments. Can we go to Psalm 40, page 600? If you love me, keep my commandments. Oh no, not more legalism, more instructions, more of those precepts that are so hard. It's just, that's, that's nothing like what God is saying to us. Psalm 40 is what he's saying to us. Psalm, go to Psalm 40, page 600. I'm, I'm looking at <clears throat> verse 8. Well, verse 7, it's, I, lo, I uh, said, I lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it's written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. It, it, it has become an absolute and delightful part of me that's changed all my motivations 
and I cannot tell you how glad I am for it. And that's what the psalmist is saying. And that's what we thank God if we know the Lord, if we're Christians, that's what we can say with him, can't we? I delight to do thy will. It isn't now an impossible challenge uh, to obey God when I don't really want to. And there's something else that motivates me that, I, that I'm driven by, other desires, passions, ambitions, what, you know, whatever it might be, longings for fulfillment and so on, which are outside of the will of God. That's gone. It's not, it's not, that battle isn't being fought anymore when we really love the Lord. That battle's finished. Sometimes we have to get to that place and it's sometimes a battle to get to that place but it's finished that battle's finished it's not a struggle anymore to do what is right it's a delight it's not a struggle anymore to live in a way that pleases God it fulfills me more than anything and I think I mentioned last week I'm pretty sure I did from John 4 when the Lord spoke about the the meat he says to the disciples when they think he's been given food by somebody and uh, this is just after he's spoken to the woman at the well and he says my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish the work I am sustained spiritually I am fed spiritually I am satisfied spiritually when I know that I am pleasing God and I'm on course to complete the thing that he has set before me and I believe, and I say it often enough, I believe God has a, a plan for every Christian life. A definite, precise purpose for every Christian life. And we should make it our business to discover and do that at any cost. And it, and it takes some doing. It takes some doing. Now, reasons to love God. The title of my talk, Reasons to Love God. Well, there's um, so many. Can we go to Judges chapter 13? It's an interesting reference which wouldn't immediately spring to mind but it came to me very firmly this is the parents of Samson I'm on page 285 if you're in the church bible Samson's parents remember an angel visits them visits the woman first you're going to conceive and this child is going to be very significant and so on he's got to be a Nazarite nothing of alcohol and cutting his hair and all that stuff um, and then the angel appears again when the husband is there, Manoah. And I'm reading in verses um, 22 and 23 of Judges 13. The angel of the Lord, uh, for 21, the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, we will surely die. We've seen God. Well, I'll come back to in a minute. But his wife said to him, If the Lord were pleased to kill us, he would not have received a burnt offering and a meat offering at our hands. Neither would he have showed us all these things. Nor would as at this time have told us such things as these. Now I want to unpack that and bring it to us. I mean, first of all... <coughs> Manoah has a consciousness of the dread being of God. We've seen God, we're going to die. We're going to die. And I've, I don't believe that anybody really gets to know God at all. Except they go through that place of really fearing God. And I mean fearing God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's where it starts. And there's no doubt that when God moves by his spirit, and when you read the history of revival, um, so many, well not as many as we'd like, but so many examples that are known to us, and there is always this, there's always this, people are absolutely brought face to face with God who is terrible. You look at Jonathan Edwards' sermon uh, in the um, 1740s, I think, in New England, and he He's reading, just, it's only, he's got short, he's short sight, he's holding it there like this, and he's just reading quietly, and sinners in the hands of an angry God, people are falling down around the church, screaming for mercy. And that happened during the 18th century revivals, 
It happened more recently in the Hebridean revival in the 1950s, and I've known people that were uh, not present there, but heard Duncan Campbell, who was used of God in that revival, have heard him speak about what happened, and you can read about it, and it was another feature. And it's always present. People actually come to see who God is. And they cry for mercy. And if we don't have that sense, I don't say we've got to all fall down and scream in terror, but if we do not have that sense of God as a righteous judge who hates sin, uh, then we don't know him at all. And there's a gospel that avoids that. And it's one of the, in my great hero West, it's one of the things which he said about the, he says there is a, which he said is more than anything else, driving light out of the world. That's how strongly he put it. Uh, where there is this so-called gospel preaching which features the atoning death of Christ, righteousness by faith, but doesn't deal with sin. But tick the box and you're on your way to heaven. But basically you can stay as you are. Or you can have a past that's so wicked it's got to be dealt with. It's got to be resolved. And you, and you can't get round that. And many people do go around that in gospel preaching, so-called. So he's conscious of the awesome majesty of God. But the wife has the thing that we need to hear. Um, and there are two things that I bring out of this. First of all, it, verse 23, if he was going to kill us, he wouldn't have received an offering. Now, we know that for the sake of our soul's salvation and survival, we are depending entirely on an offering, aren't we? An offering. Christ's atoning death is everything as far as my soul's salvation is concerned. And I hope I will be a holy man, I hope I will improve very greatly and will be pleasing to God, but if I was the best man on earth, there's not a second when I wouldn't be depending entirely on the atoning death of Jesus Christ. God has accepted an offering on our behalf, and we've put our trust in that. Psalm 50, um, Isaiah 53, I think we looked at it, maybe we did last week. Isaiah 53. God has laid on him the iniquities of us all. And then, um, neither would he have showed us all these things. Nor would he have, have he at this time told us such things as these. We, if you're a Christian, or if you are a Christian, you are blessed uh, with an awareness of spiritual truth which is wonderful. Yes, wonderful. There's, you have a revelation of truth and there's a spirit of wisdom and revelation which God gives to us. Um, which, which we, like all mankind, at one time were totally blind to. And God has opened our eyes. So those two great reasons to love God. God who has to be feared, but, we get, but that he's made a way for us through the atoning death of his son. And he's given us a revelation of truth. And this book is fantastic, isn't it? In, in the great prayer at the end of the Last Supper, the Lord says, Sanctify them by your truth. Make them holy through your truth. Your word is truth. John 17. You remember, it's part of his prayer at the end of the Last Supper. Now, another reason to love God is the promise of future wonder and glory beyond measure. Jeremiah 29, please. We're on page 781. Here's a reason to love God. The promise to those who will seek him. And it, that runs through the scriptures. New Testament. All who seek find. Old Testament Isaiah. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. And there are many other scriptures. Uh, but I'm going to Jeremiah 29. And most of you will know these verses. But they're so... Um, they're so wonderful, really. Verse 11. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. 
then you should call upon me, you should go and pray to me, and I will hearken unto you. And you shall seek me and find me, when you shall search for me with all your heart. I know the thoughts that I think towards you. God has a plan for you that is wonderful beyond measure. Do you remember how um, Paul is quoting from the Old Testament, but in uh, 1 Corinthians 2, and he speaks about this, which that eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, man, it hasn't entered the heart, it hasn't even entered our imagination. It is so good. It's so good. The things that God has. I'm just reading it. I didn't write it down, but I'm um, in 1 Corinthians 2. You need to, I'll just read it, verse 9. As it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. It is so good. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of, of peace and not of evil. God's promise of a future that's wonderful for those that will be serious in seeking. And then another reason to love God is the, the provision that he's made for what we need more than we can imagine, and that is intercession. Go to Hebrews 7, if you would. And this is something, page 1194, this is something God has taken into his own hand because he knows how much every one of our souls needs this. We need it desperately. Far more than we actually understand. And uh, we'll look at that in connection with Peter in a minute. But um, Hebrews, se Hebrews 7 verse 25, Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing that he, that is Christ, ever lives to make intercession for them. And um, I looked up the Greek word, pantalos, which is uh, the whole man, the whole race, and pantalos, perfection. In other words, interceding for us completely, the whole of us, and to perfection. That, that what God really means to do with us will be done. And it's against all the odds. And it's secured by the very prayers of Christ himself. And then in Romans 8, where we see that the Spirit of God does the same kind of work. I'm on page 1124. And <clears throat> verse, verse 26. I think I'll read 24 and 5 as well if you read into it. Uh, Romans 8. We're saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man sees, why does he get hope for? If, you, if it's there and you've got hold of it, well, you don't have to hope for it, do you? There it is, you've got it. He's saying something more than that. Something that, by reason of what God is saying to me, I know is there, waiting, and will be. Even though I may not have it yet in its fullness for we are saved by hope and then in verse 25 if we hope for that verse 25, if we hope for that we see not then do we with patience wait for it and patience is such an important thing I think maybe the next Sunday when I'm going to mention this it's really on my heart I don't normally have any idea a week away what I'm going to speak about but I think we will be looking partly at that but um, so then do we with patience wait for it then likewise the spirit God's own Spirit also helps our infirmities. We know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. I wonder if we can reflect on that for a moment, try and imagine it. Um, I'm, not quite, I'm not entirely sure of the mechanism. I know that I've personally prayed in tongues with groanings that can't be uttered in a way for it on a few occasions but I don't, I don't think it's that I think it's something that's ongoing in the heavenly realm where God's spirit is lifting up the need of your soul and it, it, if the if the passion and the urgency that is implied in groanings that can't be uttered is so then there must be a real issue about your soul mustn't there they had that, doesn't that make isn't that impliedly so if God's own spirit is praying for me with that kind of intensity, something very important is being decided and settled in prayer. 
And if I'm not thankful to God for that, well, there's something wrong with me, isn't there? Reasons to love God. If I don't love God for that, that he himself... I mean, I'm very glad that people pray for me, and I know that, and I know that you do, and I'm very, very, very thankful for that. I can't tell you how thankful I am, actually. And I pray for many others. But everything we do is flawed, isn't it? But to think that God himself he has taken to himself the cause of our soul's spiritual safety and prosperity and fulfillment and development and completion of what God intends and he himself is interceding to see that happens. Isn't that a reason to love God? Isn't that a reason to love God? Now, Peter, going back to John <coughs> 21, he had himself benefited so much from the intercession of the Son of God. You remember, there is a direct, specific attack on Peter's soul, Satan himself. It's, it's a personal thing. Has, has, has asked to do to Peter something that will just sweep his faith away. That's the intention. That's the plan. That's the plan. And um, I don't think Peter has any idea, we didn't have any idea, of the tremendous issues that were being decided in the, in the unseen world concerning him. Because when, um, it's in Luke, isn't it, when he's told this, he says, no, I will go to prison and to death with you. I, you won't, I won't, the others might desert, not me. And he meant it with all his heart. And he was a courageous man. You can, you can see that as you read about the way he was often the one that was first and the spoke to me it's the one that stepped off the boat into the water you remember but um, he has no idea who he's up against and I, and I do I don't want to frighten anybody and I don't want to certainly I don't want to glorify Satan but I greatly respect him but I do think we need to understand who we are up against and that's why we have to hide in Christ and we have to use the safeguards and the weapons that God gives. They are spiritual. The natural, natural thing is useless in this, this realm, in this conflict, against this particular adversary. It's Peter, Satan has desired to have you and sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you. And I, I don't know, nobody knows, but I bet that praying was as intense and I'd almost say desperate and determined until he got right through to get that answer that, that meant Peter would survive and come out of that trial. Because he said, and he knows he's got the answer. He says, when you, when you turn back, strengthen your brethren. Let this terrible test that you in yourself will fail, but I will get you through by my prayers. Let this be a means of strengthening others. And so often that happens, doesn't it? We go through something, we don't know what it's for, and then we suddenly find out it was to enable me to help others. And of course, this is, this is at a higher level. This is the Apostle Peter and the ministry that he's going to give. And that he's going to win the battle where he lost it. That's the other thing. You know, he, he's told that you're going to, at the moment you're strong, you put your cloak on and you march off. When you're old, probably in some horrible prison cell in Rome, Someone else is going to wrap your, probably your pretty ragged old cloak around you and take you where you don't want to go, to a painful death. But he was going to triumph where he'd failed. He couldn't face it. And he denied the Lord with oaths and curses. But now something more has happened. That we'll see him through. And can I just say this out of that thought as, a last, as my final thought? Now, if something has happened in your past, a failure, an inability to get through to the Lord, or a time of attempting faith that didn't, just couldn't be pushed through, um, surely this is an example of restoration, of victory, exactly where defeat took place. Because now this is something new, isn't it? He, the Lord is risen. The Lord has paid the price for their failings and their sins. The Lord is going to commission them and he's going to, when he ascends, after he ascends, he's going to send the Holy Spirit and they're going to be filled with the Spirit. 
They, they're going to go forward in, in a new way. And this man is being restored to get him ready for that. And I want to make that ours this morning. I and mean, this is 2,000 years ago, and this is a very great man, and these are very great things, but it's absolutely personal to every Christian. If I didn't manage it before, then I can get through to Christ. And he will enable me to manage it now. Uh, if I wasn't strong before, I can be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. I'm quoting from Ephesians. Strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. And that's what happened to Peter. The day of Pentecost, you remember how God's spirit came to them. And uh, he stands up in his first sermon, he gets 3,000 converts. You know, the way things have changed once God is in it. So I hope I've encouraged you and I want us to go away really knowing that we have tremendous reasons to love God because love is of immense importance individually and as a church. We've got to, our light will blaze brightly if we really love. Thank you. Thanks,